Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, we uh, will begin with our um, August meeting of uh, the Cook County uh, Commission on Social Innovation. Uh, Talia, uh, can you please call attendance so that we could establish quorum? Yes, thank you everyone for your patience. I hope you're all doing good. To start off with attendance, I'm gonna start with Chair Anaya. Present. Vice Chair Lane. Uh, present, thank you, Celia. Commissioner Aglipe. Mayor Osbury. Here. Thank you. Sin. Commissioner Anderson. Commissioner Brutus. Commissioner Caliento. Commissioner Cooley. Commissioner De Laurentiis. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Dubo. Present. Thanks. Commissioner Espinosa. Commissioner Flores. Commissioner Freeman. Present. Commissioner Guajardo. Alder Person Haddon. Mm -hmm. Superintendent Killen. Present. Commissioner Mails. Present. Commissioner Malone. Commissioner Raymer. Present. Commissioner Rice. Present. Commissioner Slizer. Present. Commissioner Thomas. And Commissioner Yonan. Present. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Talia. Um, so we will begin um, with public speakers. Were there any uh, registered public speakers or any public testimony that was submitted, Talia? No, we currently don't have anything submitted. I believe you're muted, Commissioner. Commissioner, you're currently muted. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, so I was uh, just saying that um, the next item on our agenda was the approval of the minutes, but I believe we're missing one individual um, to have full quorum. So we'll have to table that. Um, and then we'll go into any updates from chair, vice chair. There's none on my end of uh, vice chair lane. Um, did you have any updates on your end? Uh, nor on mine, Madam Chair. And I uh, am eager to get into uh, today's uh, testimony from our expert witness. So with your permission, why don't we transition in that Absolutely. direction? Absolutely. Well, Please. thank you. So uh, last month we had some uh, very uh, stimulating testimony uh, by uh, Jens Ludwig, who is the director of the University of Chicago's crime lab. Uh, looking at cost-effective ways uh, to reduce crime in the county, uh, relying upon behavioral sciences. Uh, today, we have a no less stimulating presentation in the offing, um, which uh, looks at uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, as a, a tool to improve the quality of uh, decision-making uh, around uh, patterns of crime. Uh, and uh, so it's a, a great privilege to introduce uh, Professor Ishanu Chattopayai, uh, who is at the University of Chicago uh, Medicine. Uh, and uh, delighted to have you with us. And I will uh, turn the floor over to you, Ishanu. Thank you, for, thank you again for uh, taking the time to educate us. And, and you are muted. Thank you, Mark. Thank um, you. Can you, uh, can I share my screen? Is that possible at all? Yes, yeah, I can, can make I you, can make co you co host. co-host. Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. <clears throat> I 
And while that's getting figured out, Dalia, if you don't mind um, adding um, Commissioner Cooley to the attendance. Okay, great. Uh, I, 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 I hope you can see my screen. Yes, thank you. Okay. So uh, thank you, Mark, again, from, for making this happen. And I'm delighted and excited to talk to you, the, the commission. My background, uh, as Mark said, I'm with the University of Chicago, I'm assistant professor of medicine. My background, uh, however, is in machine learning, AI, data science. So what my uh, appointment is, what I'm supposed to do at the university is look at big data problems and where uh, typically problems which do not have an obvious solution in the context of medicine and social sciences and see if um, sophisticated analytics, algorithms, artificial intelligence can guide us towards potential solutions. So we are, uh, Mark reached out to me because we had uh, our group uh, had a study published uh, at the beginning of the month, I think, first July or, or, or the last day of June or something, the study came out, on um, the ability to predict crime. And we're going to, go into that, uh, how, and there was a lot of discussion in the media about this. Uh, a, a large number of those were not quite to the point of what the paper or the study actually does. We're going to go into that and how that um, helps us or how that kind of um, channels into possible um, recommendations for the commission. So, so that's, that's what, as you see on the screen, uh, that's what I'm going to more or less talk about, a proposal to leverage data science AI to understand patterns of crime and how we can leverage those patterns for social good. Let's see. Now, crime uh, is a global problem. It's not just a problem with, uh, in Chicago or the Cook County, it's really uh, one of the leading causes of death for um, young people, 15 to 49, young to youngish people. And you can see it just right up there with uh, digestive diseases, uh, tuberculosis. Uh, so homicide is right up there. It's like one of the top, uh, within the top five or six or seven uh, causes of death. And uh, statistics for Cook County is uh, less than stellar. I don't have access to 2022 statistics yet, but 2021, there were over I think about 1,200 or 1,300 uh, homicides. Um, so it's a, it's a problem, it's a social problem that we should think about and see how we can make things better. Now, uh, in 2020s, 2021, 22, we have uh, access to huge amounts of data. It's been not that it came up this year. In recent times, we have had access to large amounts of data, really large amounts of data. And we have also access to um, sophisticated ways of processing, analyzing those data to find patterns that might help us see connections and make decisions based on those insights that we would not have been able to do even five years back or six years back or 10 years back. So can this kind of data help? You have the sophisticated algorithms with huge amounts of data, maybe combine that with uh, social theory that we, uh, we know how uh, social systems work. We don't know everything about them, but we have uh, definitely thought about it for the last couple of centuries. So how uh, enforcement works, how crime works, how these two things interact with other factors, uh, socioeconomic factors. Can we all bring that all together to make better decisions? And um, perhaps the answer, the short answer for that is perhaps, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. But whenever we talk about AI prediction and crime in the same sentence, um, we are kind of, uh, we get a pushback uh, for good reasons. It's not the first time uh, predictive policing has been tried. And what I'm going to talk about is not really about predictive policing. I'm going to, talk, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, expand on what I mean by that. But predictive policing has been tried in the past and it has not worked very well. The systems were not as predictive as one thought they would be. Um, there were, they propagated biases. There, was, there were huge pushbacks from the community, uh, maybe over policing and maybe uh, even uh, legitimizing bias under the guise of see it's an algorithm, so it obviously can't be biased. So that is not actually true. 
because algorithms need to be trained. And if there are biases in the data and in the training procedures, then it will get uh, what you put in, it will get out what you put in. So those are the perils of predictive policing that we know of. We have, it has been tried many times in many parts of the country and um, not very, has not been very successful. So the question is, what I'm talking about, is that going to be any different? And uh, perhaps, again, the answer is perhaps, we think it would be. And let's talk about why. So that's that's the paper that I'm talking about. That's a study that came out in Natural Human Behavior. And uh, it's kind of blew up like anything, which was kind of a bit unexpected. Um, got way more uh, views and discussions and uh, news coverage than some other work that we have been doing in the, in the group. It's kind of interesting. Um, but not think about it, not really that unexpected. This It's very technical, it has sophisticated algorithms in it, but also it's, it's kind of addressing uh, an issue that is of importance currently, very important currently. So it talks about predicting crime in urban spaces. It looks at uh, eight cities in the US and uh, looks at uh, how we can come up with a predictive model of violent crime and property crimes in those cities, not just predicting crime rates, but actually predicting individual events sufficiently ahead of time and within a sufficiently small uh, area that it becomes actionable. So that's one part of it. The other part is we can, since we can actually do this, we have a very good model of uh, how the system works and we can then push, pull, tug and pull at it, uh, probe the connections that are driving the system and uh, recognize biases in it. That was the other part of the paper, which was actually uh, what was highlighted, but um, the most of the discussion was that, that, that emerged was around the fact that it predicts crime. Now, as I said, that it's going to be different. It is different from other predictive policing attempts or able or attempts at predicting crime in future um, that, has, that has been reported. It is somewhat different. So the key difference, and there, I will not going, I'm not going to talk about the underlying mathematical details, although there are quite a bit differences in those aspects. Um, but at a, at a high level, the difference is uh, this study was never ne the, the objective or the goal of the study was not to come up with a predictive policing tool. The goal of the study was to create a digital twin of the social system of interaction between crime enforcement and other socioeconomic factors. So that's uh, so. This notion of digital twin is uh, more often, most of, like most com commonly used in the domain of engineering, where you have this uh, complex engineering systems. It might be a car, an aircraft, or a power plant, and you'd have a digital model. You have, you'll have a mathematical model of the system in your computer, or in a very large computer. Uh, these models get really complex. And the advantage of having that is you can see what happens if certain parts fail or certain kind of events happen in the system. What would be the effect um, downstream or uh, system-wide? Or does uh, is, are there vulnerabilities that we need to address? So that it's very, very useful to having like, not just modeling individual components, but to have, but to have like, um, a, 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 like a complete total model of the system in place. Now, as I said, it is already very difficult to do this for engineering systems. To having a digital twin of a car, like a true digital twin, is hard. For an aircraft, like a, like a Boeing aircraft, it is incredibly difficult to make something like that. Uh, but those problems, those, uh, those systems are, are incredibly simple compared to a, a social system of interaction where there is crime happening in an urban space, there are socioeconomic factors, all sorts of things, human free will. So trying to come up with a digital twin of a social system is incredibly difficult. And that's what this study actually does, not completely, but takes a big step towards that. So, so that's, that's, that's one of the reasons why uh, what this study, what it tries to do, what the goal is, and the way it does it is different from what has been tried before. And also we were very aware of that uh, anytime you're talking about modeling crime, um, you don't really get to observe actual crime. You get to observe or your reports are, um, are log what is actually reported, right? So not the actual crimes, but what is actually reported, what is observed. 
Um, so if there are differential policing rates in different communities, you will get differential crime rates. Also, different communities have different degree of confidence in law enforcement. So certain crimes are reported uh, at differential rates in different communities. So all that factors are built in. You can't really decouple it. You can't think of a very clean, nice data set um, over, uh, over a very nice spatial grid, and you're going to model that. That's not how it works. That's the data that we have to work with, because that is, uh, that's just life. So we, have, we were very aware of this. So there's all these biases are built in. And so we were, um, what we did, what, what, what we did was we kind of thought about how to actively minimize that, right? So one aspect of where the bias comes from is all of this confounding factors. The other aspect, and this is the reason why many of the uh, previous approaches didn't really work or had big pushback from the communities is um, more often than not, you take data, uh, when, you're, when you're training a machine learning system, uh, you take data, you decide which factors are uh, driving the system. You call them features, you pick the features, and then you use a sophisticated learning pattern recognition algorithm or a modeling algorithm, modeling tool uh, to connect those features to your outputs. But those features are chosen by hand. And if you do that, you can actually inject bias without even realizing it. So a, a good example is uh, when uh, Chicago Police Department tried to do their, um, I forget what it's called, tried to come up with a list of uh, potential perpetrators and victims of gun violence. And uh, what they used was an equation that I think some people from Northwestern worked on. And uh, the idea was we're going to find um, individuals who uh, can be on the list, who are at the risk of either being a perpetrator or a victim of gun violence by looking at certain aspects of the victims of that individual's life. Was he or she been arrested before? What was their age and all that? And then they kept the list secret. They, they, tried, they implemented that and they kept the list secret. After a legal battle, when the list was uh, finally made public, um, it came out that about, I don't know, about 50% of the black population of the city was on the list. Now, I don't think there was any malice and it was shut down uh, obviously soon after. Um, I don't think that this, it was a result of malice. It's like we take a really complex system, like a social system, interaction of law enforcement, crime, socioeconomic factors, uh, human factors, and try to boil it down to, a, to an equation that you decide a priori, then this is what is going to happen every time. So our idea was we are not going to start with these assumptions. We're going to let the data tell its story. So we started with just public data on uh, event logs. So it turns out the city of Chicago data portal has uh, such a log, which is updated daily with a seven day delay. It tells you the timestamp, the geographical location, the nature of infraction, and if any arrests were made on site. So it's really an event log, right? Um, and many other cities in the US also have this. So that's why we were able to replicate these results uh, in seven other cities. But that's, uh, that's what we started with. And the idea was to be, to be able to look at, look for patterns in this historical data set and not make any assumptions of which factors might be responsible for driving crime or making crime more likely. Let's not decide that by ourselves. Let's look at the data. Let's look at what patterns are there and which patterns are predictive. And we'll validate the data and, and uh, we we'll learn the data for some time and then validate the data after that and see what that gets us. Right, so that, that was really the approach. And um, different, quite different from other predictive policing uh, approaches, but not all appro uh, past approaches focus on individuals, but some have tried. Um, our approach doesn't predict, do, does, doesn't do any prediction on individuals. It's all de-identified data. So there is, it isn't even possible using this tool to put people in jail before they have committed a crime. So the, this whole idea of this looks like the Minority Report movie, which was like about 80% uh, of all the social media discussion around the study, it, it's not just true. And um, so there's no identifiable data, it's only the de-identified data, there's no uh, privacy encroachment, and there's no hidden lists. So that's what when, when, we said, when I said that we thought a lot about minimizing bias, we also thought about what would make such a system fair, right? First of all, there shouldn't be any bias, we should try to minimize that. But also there has to be a perception of fairness, not just actual fairness, but also a perception of fairness. So there are no hidden lists. 
there are no hidden models. The data is public, the algorithm uh, is open source, and anyone with a moderately sufficient uh, computing setup can actually replicate the results. So there's nothing that is under the table, hidden, not made public. Everything is open source and transparent. So what can we do with it? Uh, here is something, the first thing that we can do, we can make a good model or it turns out that what we did there are actually results and good predictive performance. So one of the things that we could do with it is do something like a crime forecast. So uh, here, what you see on the screen, um, the stuff that looks like this clouds, uh, greenish and yellowish, those are the risk map and the actual black dots are the events. So the risk was estimated a week in advance and uh, it predicts events within a couple of blocks, city blocks, with a plus minus one day of uh, temporal uncertainty. So, and we get, what, what we get performance wise, is get about 93% accuracy in Chicago. It changes a bit from one city to the next, about 87% AUC, which kind of, uh, if you choose a particular operating point, that translates to about 70% specificity and about 80% sensitivity. So what those, num those numbers mean? It means that uh, roughly if there are 10, on average, if there are 10 actual crimes with a, in, in a particular city block or a couple of city blocks and that, that kind of area, if there are 10 actual crimes, uh, the system predicts 11, out of which eight are correct within that area, within that time period, two are missed, and there are three false alarms. And all of that is done a week in advance. So that makes it very actionable. So and that kind of uh, vastly outperforms the, uh, the, the reported capabilities of previous algorithms. But that, again, that is, this is kind of a side effect, if you may. The real goal, as I said, was to come up with a digital twin. And once we have, uh, and this, the, that it performs really well, makes its predictions really well, is actually a validation of that, that yes, we actually have something that can replicate the dynamics of this interactions. Uh, why? Because, well, we can get predictions from it and that matches what happens in reality in future, which was not used in training. So once we have such a digital twin, what can we do with it? Well, we can do experiments on it. We can say that what happens if the crime rate goes down in this part of the city or crime rate goes up in this part of the city? What happens to the enforcement response? Right, that's a very simple, almost obvious thing, and that we, we talk about that in the study as well. And we, when we did that, we found something very interesting. We found that um, this enforcement response actually um, has a strong dependence on the socioeconomic status of the communities or the neighborhoods. Um, in general, there would be some dependence, right, because the crime rates are higher in poorer neighborhoods, so there would be more enforcement response. But once you control for that, once you control for the differential crime rates, uh, the enforcement in a truly unbiased scenario uh, should not be, no, should no longer be dependent on the socioeconomic variables. And that's not what we found. We found that even after we control all differential crime rates, it still is dependent, as dependent in, in a very interesting way. It's dependent in the, in, in the following way. If you increase the crime rate in um, more wealthy or well-off, higher ACS neighborhoods, then the enforcement kind of tracks, number of arrests kind of track the increasing crime rates. Whereas what happens in the neighboring uh, poorer neighborhoods is that the enforcement, the number of arrests actually crash. So one possible explanation from this that we made a hypothesis of is um, the resources are drawn in and sucked in to by the more well-off neighborhoods, which causes um, essentially the poorer neighborhoods to be less um, overlooked, really. And we, we made this hypothesis and we looked at other cities, whether that is actually true in other places. And we saw that uh, pretty much wherever we looked, we have the same kind of uh, signature that is there. So that's, that's one thing that you can do. You can do many other things. Um, that's what it stated. That's what we talked about, talk about in the study. But the idea is that we came up with this really precise tool for modeling this interaction between crime, uh, enforcement, socioeconomic factors. And it is actually very predictive, which gives you the validation that it's a good tool, uh, it's a good model. And then you can do all those experiments. You can, you can, you can um, uh, test whether certain policies are going to be effective. If you want to come up with an optimal resource allocation, you can um, basically quantify uh, how different effort, like allocation policies would behave in the long run, right? 
So, so really, um, coming to the concrete proposals is, is the following. Uh, we know that for social improvement strategies, some social improvement strategies uh, work better than others. And some of, and some of this, uh, some of this kind of actions are pretty simple, like having better lighting, uh, greening your neighborhood or having a cleaner neighborhood. This actually modifies human behavior and reduces crime. Now, of course, all of that takes money and effort and resources. So where should we put the optimal resources? Should we just go by gut on where this uh, action should be taken? Or can we actually quantify this and make optimal recommendations? So that is something that can be done with models like this. Uh, better use of uh, data science in law enforcement. Again, where to deploy police officers for maximum impact. The resources are finite, so we cannot, and nor should we, uh, flood everywhere with um, enforcement personnel. So where should they be, given that there's a finite resources and this kind of deployment policies might have differential impact, even non-trivial long-range long impact on how crime evolves in the city. And we can again quantify that and use them use this kind of modeling to hash that out. Um, and also something that is might be more controversial is can we actually investigate the relationship between violent and property crimes? So more like what happens after people get or whether people get arrested for uh, petty crimes and what happens, what kind of uh, um, sentencing or what kind of uh, penalty is uh, is given out for what different crimes does uh, does prosecuting property crimes actually lead to lower rates of violent crimes or is the relationship the other way around uh, so all of those questions again can be investigated in much more details when you have this kind of uh, uh, this kind of models to back you up so that's uh, that's what i'm going to talk about and um, questions well thank you very much i'm sure there will be uh many questions um let's get that screen down so we can take a look at the commission if we may okay so i invite questions from the commissioners let's mark see top, i don't have i'm on the phone i can't raise my hand very easily i can't find the button I'll consider your hand as having been raised howard what Please go ahead. Thank you so much. And uh, Professor, thank you very, very much for this uh, presentation. I, I love uh, data science as it impacts upon the everyday life experience that makes uh, for, I hope, commonsensical decisions and some, uh, some not so uh, intuitive reasoning about how we go about solving a problem. My question is about the data science and the AI modeling capabilities for accounting for macro events. Example, locally, the um, murder of George Floyd, the reaction on uh, the social level. And I'm, 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 do I understand correctly, you're a sociologist, Professor? Um, uh, not quite. Okay. Uh, not quite, but, but yeah, I work with sociologists. Uh, yeah, go on. The only reason I ask is I trained as a, you know, social psychologist. So I straddled a bunch of things before data science became a thing. Right. And of course I've matured. And what I'm looking at is how we can look at these macro events and account with using the kind of data science you're using, plus the echo events that uh, keep seem to follow after the big one, the things that are occurring in our city and our county. Thank you. So that, that's a very interesting question. So uh, if I if I may boil it down, uh, and this is this is like actually a question of big of uh, that has a lot of interests um, from a lot of different stakeholders, uh, including uh, some government agencies. So the idea, so the question really is: if you see something happening online or some some precursor event, uh, a discussion un unfolding online. How much of that really uh, translates to real life actions? That's not exactly the question that um, Harold, I think, asked, but it's kind of similar, right? So if you see uh, certain events happening and then you can observe uh, a discussion kind of uh, evolving or emerging, what do we expect? Can we model what's gonna happen after that? Um, 
So we haven't done that. So I cannot say for sure it can be done. And also to be able to act to actually be able to do that, you have to have you have to look at data that is not public, right? I mean, not all uh, you have to look at social media posts, for example. Uh, you have to look at all these things. So not something that you can just uh, run without uh, bringing on board people who have access to the data. But if you had, if you could do that, then yeah, certainly. So if you ask me, can Facebook or Google uh, predict all these events? Yes, they can, uh, if they wanted to. It's a different question whether they, they would want to or whether what had, what, how, how that kind of, uh, what are the implications of that? Or whether we even want them to do this, that's also a different dis discussion that we are actually now actively having everywhere. But yeah, certainly that is possible, but not, not, not with just uh, public data. If you just have data that I can access without signing any NDA or without informing anyone just that is out in the, in the, on the internet, then probably that is a bit more difficult. And of course, the, the contention would be on, on the other end is that Meta actually may have access to the kinds of data that you're talking about and may be doing such uh, exercises in, in uh, what happens socially among us. So thank you for addressing my question. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I would comment that just because Google, the, the, the big tech, has a capability of doing it doesn't necessarily mean they are. I mean, they are driven by profit, right? I mean, in academia, this is what we do. We sit here all day and think about stuff and do fun stuff. And that's why I do this job. But if you are uh, the, the, the lead in research of all the big tech companies, you have to think about what actually gives you a return. So just predicting social events. Or, or, what, or what they're obligated to do by law. Right. Uh, yes. Commissioner Killen, please. Thank you, Vice Chair. So there was a, something that popped up on your last slide that kind of piqued my interest. So I'm in the transportation space and you had mentioned, you know, AI kind of being able to identify, you know, street lighting. And I think it may have said, what was it, streetscaping, you know, other types of infrastructure improvements that can also aid in the reduction of crime. If you could elaborate a little bit on that, that would be great. So this, this is a known fact. And uh, Mark asked, well, I'm, I'm a sociologist. So if I had to characterize myself, I would be a computer scientist, but I work, uh, I'm, my appointment is in medicine. I work with social scientists all the time. My collaborator here uh, is a professor in sociology. So it's hard to kind of even tell people what I actually am. It's hard. <laughs> uh, but, but, that, but this is what you ask is it's, it's, a, it's a known, kind of uh, sociologists have, have known this for some time, right? If your neighborhood looks better, if you are, it's cleaner, if it is more lighting, mm -hmm. uh, and that changes people's behavior. First of all, it, it decreases opportunity of crime, and but uh, it has been suggested that it is actually more than that. It's not just that crime goes down in a well-lit, nice streetscape place, uh, spaces, because well, there's more light. It's not just that. Uh, right. It actually changes human behavior. It increases um, social engagement, uh, community engagement. So, so all that factors come in. But the, but the point I was making is, so this is known. This is actually known. Mm -hmm. uh, I think different cities, I think Philadelphia is trying this uh, quite actively. Uh, so the point I was making is uh, all of that takes effort, takes resources. So where should you put the resource? It would be great if you can, I don't know, sit, landscape the whole uh, Chicago and whole Cook County, uh, well, that's kind of not realistic, right? So given a particular constraint and resources, where should you focus your resources? How would you make yes. that decision? Right. That's what I was kind of getting at because we, we do these projects all the time. I think if there were additional data sets that kind of help prioritize as we're evaluating different corridors, um, you know, for improvements, you know, where certain, I'm gonna use air quotes now, aesthetics really are not optional, but really would bring about this betterment. So how, how we can be aware of some of that data, um, I think how we can help make a difference in our space. Right. And the, one, the way to do it in the context of what I was talking about, if you have this, this model of a digital twin of this interacting system, then you can say that what happens, uh, assume that if you do streetscaping, then the crime goes, around, goes down a little bit around that space, around that local region. Then which uh, regions do we need to affect to have the maximum uh, long-term effect and the maximum ba ba bang for your buck? Really, that's what the we can we can answer that uh, mathematically and quantitatively. So that's that's the point I was making. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Raymer. Please. 
Yes, hi, thanks. Um, lower my hand here. Can we get a copy of that report um, distributed to the commission? Yes, absolutely. I think that would be fantastic to read and get into that. So I have like two, two questions. One of them is, um, <clears throat> Ishanu, for you, for you, but also for the, the you know, Commissioner Anaya and all of the, um, you know, folks that are working in government right now, just your perspective of like, you know, some of these things are, you can get the intel from community members. They know their neighborhoods, they know what's going on, um, and they don't, need a data, big data set to be able to be like recognize the need and communicate it strongly to officials. So I'd be curious, uh, your, the reception that you're getting from government entities and community activists, you know, like, you know, how is that argument going between like the real human knowledge and human connections and advocacy versus the, the pure data kind of, you know, importance, mm -hmm. but challenges with that. And then um, from just, you know, Commissioner Anaya and stuff, like when you guys are, are looking at budgets and everything, how do you balance what you know and you're hearing from your constituents on the human level versus a data set that might tip it in a certain direction or, or not make, I don't know, just kind of how do you work with those two things? And then my second quick question is just uh, in your data modeling, have you tested out income in levels as maybe a uh, factor in violence reduction, if you would raise, a, everybody had a job at a certain dollar level, how would violence oh. happen? So those two things, thanks. Should I, should I check? Should I go, for, go first? Yeah, sure, okay. let me think. So uh, let me answer the second question first. So is, there, is income a factor in crime? Yes, absolutely. That you don't need, need even sophisticated modeling to see that. You, could, you can just plot the crime rates in different parts of the city and uh, look at what's the association with um, different SES variables and you would see that uh, poorer neighborhoods have a lot, have, have um, higher rates of crime. So it doesn't mean that it's a causal relationship, but uh, looks like it is. Oh, sorry about that. Looks like it is. So if you, yeah, if things got better, economic good goes better than crime rates typically improve. So again, that is, pretty well known. Uh, the question really is how do we get there? That's kind of much bigger question than we can address here, of course. Um, for your first question, remind me what what, did, what, did, what were you uh, talking about? What was the first question I kind well, of- Well, just how, how, what's the response oh, you're getting? Right, uh, right, right. Yeah, between so, data and human knowledge, right? Yeah, yeah. So the two points on in that, one is in, uh, if you take concrete examples of the big cities in the US, Chicago, Philadelphia, other places, um, there is currently we're experiencing a relatively high crime rate and that can be you kind of plot how crime rates change over time. This is one of those 30 year high cycles, a high point of a 30 year cycle. So that's kind of that's kind of interesting, which people never really talk about that. It's um, might not be the impact of what was happening last year or year before that or year before that. It might be something that happens periodically. But even with that, um, there is a lot of crime. Right. So a lot of neighborhoods are there who need help, who would like uh, more resources been spent. But then there's a question of constrained resources, right? You can't uh, have infinite resources uh, and you can't spend as much money and everywhere that you would like to. So the question really is that if you had that, that if you had to operate and which you are uh, under those constraints, how do you optimize those decisions, right? So that's, that's kind of one comment. The other one is how do people um, take this? So I think people who are into, uh, into kind of data analysis and you'd like to see more modeling done, uh, particularly in government agencies, they are very interested in this because you see, if you can do this, we can find, if you can make a digital twin of a system like this, this is not the only system this is applicable to. It basically is applicable to many other uh, systems which some of the agencies that I work with are very interested in. So that's, that's there. Uh, at the human level, I think um, just uh, I will just comment on the uh, reaction that uh, some part some people had uh, in the in the in the online discussions that emerged after the study came out. A lot of it was uh, some suspicion of any kind of algorithm that tries to 
uh, model things like human behavior or, or crime. And there's this uh, kind of fear that people will be put in jail before they have committed a crime. That's of course not true. We, we can't do it even if we wanted to with the, with the approach that we have because it doesn't, uh, not that we want to put people in jail. I'm saying that there's not, there's outside the scope of this approach, right? We are not predicting individual behavior. We are predicting uh, what happens in places and times. But even then, there is some uh, pushback or some kind of questions on you know, what, how can you even predict that? It doesn't that kind of put constraints. So we have had this this kind of discussions with uh, with some people, and um, but yeah, but that's that's what that's what the kind of the back and forth that uh, we have had. Thank you, Commissioner Freeman. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and I am going to start with my body. I was one of those people when you first started talking who immediately pictured Minority Report. Um, not from the standpoint of predicting the crime before it occurs, but from the standpoint of manipulating the crime to occur. So one of the things you talked about was identifying the overlay between crime and like things like uh, property crime and the uh, other prediction of crime. Essentially, the underlying concern is poverty breeds crime. And like some of the studies, I think it was in 2015 or 2014, um, the Illinois Million Dollar Block Study that pretty much identified that while there were these extremely poor communities on the South and the West sides, that the prison industrial complex is who profited. So in having a tool like this, it does become extremely concerning around not policing or jailing people before the crime occurs, but creating and essentially manipulating situations to almost, uh, you can essentially create the crime by creating the environment for criminality to occur. And so there's a flip side of this type of AI, while I think it can be used uh, to deter and identify opportunities for investment, we do have to acknowledge, like when you say, well, where could the money be made? Google could absolutely make money. <laughs> like in my mind, it's very clear how the money is made tying into the prison industrial complex. So communities, I do want to, to ensure that some of this quote unquote paranoia or conspiracy theory is driven in very real hyper-local experiences. And so Wendy, when Wendy is asking how is human input taken into this, this AI, that is a very real concern um, because these communities are experiencing things that cannot totally be described by the data that you're collecting. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. I mean, uh, you are absolutely correct. So any kind of uh, predictive capability or any kind of science for that matter, there's a way of monetizing it. There's a way of making it uh, used for horrible outcomes. I mean, that, that's true for pretty much any, uh, any kind of scientific uh, innovation that comes along. Now, a couple of points. One is, um, yeah, Google can do it, but they don't because it doesn't have immediate uh, payoffs in some sense. That's what I would say. They are not not doing it because they uh, they have the out of the goodness of their heart. They, they are corporate entities. Their objective is to make money. So uh, if it was a very easily doable, you would see that. Or maybe they are doing it. Maybe the examples that you gave uh, some of the some of the stuff does feed into that. Uh, that's one. The other is. Um, one way to look at it is uh, all these concerns that you're raising are, are very real. I completely agree with that. One of the points to keep in mind, though, is AI uh, analytics. This is here to all this. All these things are here to stay. It's not we, we can't put the cat back in the box or whatever way the saying goes. Right. Uh, if you look at five years back, what we were capable of, we as in the collective uh, tech people, tech community, what we were capable of. Uh, it has it is becoming it has exponentially improved now. The computing costs have gone down exponentially. Your ability to collect data have gone up exponentially. All that is happening. So AI is going to be here. It is going to be able to. It is going to impact your lives more and more. And there's 
you can't you cannot stop it in that sense what you can do is to make sure that this power doesn't just make what result in what you are suggesting that can happen maybe we try to democratize the ai right the ai algorithms and that is what this particular approach tries to do there are is it, it makes it completely and totally transparent so it, it kind of takes this capability of this power from the hand of the state and kind of makes it in the keeps it in the public domain so anyone can actually run these things run these models and see what's happening and uh yeah so that's that's kind of one way of uh making sure that we don't uh, descend into a dystopia like what you were uh, what what you were suggesting can happen and, and that's a real risk i completely agree with that thank you commissioner dubo Thank you. Um, so thank you, Professor, for that presentation. You know, it's interesting. So it seems to me, and you you called this out actually in the example that you showed that, you know, by looking at this in a geolocation way, this gets to some really interesting tools for police departments. Let's take CPD for an example, um, to optimize deployment strategies. Now in the city of Chicago, we don't really know what the deployment strategies are. You know, CPD has come under fire, so to speak, for not having a lot of information out there about how they're deploying the force. And what's interesting in this is it could get to some of what are considered, you know, much better practices for reducing violence overall and increasing public safety in terms of, um, policing, you know, optimizing the way you police hotspots. So not targeting people, but targeting very specific locations where there's trends of crimes that occur. So not targeting neighborhoods, not targeting specific people, but the actual hotspots. And then potentially even the way you police, like beat policing, right? These are things that a lot of people have called out that, you know, CPD could really benefit from. Right. So you know, so that, that there's a lot of power in this for, I see it more on that side than on the community side on deployment strategies and transparency around that. You know, so I'm curious, are you already working with CPD? Are you working with other cities? You know, are there, is there a city that stepped forward um, that's really hungry for this that, you know, we can learn from? You know, I'm just sort of um, wondering yeah, if that so is it, right, right. So we actually had an opportunity uh, to use uh, the beat uh, information in the modeling, but we chose not to. And the reason why we chose not to is because we wanted to, at least this study, the first study, the initial study, we wanted to keep it uh, restricted to only public data, right? So where the police officers are in their beats, uh, that information, CPD has that, obviously, uh, we, uh, but it's not in a public domain uh, for good reasons. So we wanted yeah. to keep that out, but definitely using that would make it better. Def the predictions would get even better, and we can even optimize those uh, deployment things. I think that that can that should be done, really, if you ask me. Um, whether we are working with CPD right now, no, we have we are not yet. We might. Uh, there are a couple of other cities uh, who are, uh, are very interested in this, but we are kind of taking it. We and by we, I mean here me and my collaborators. We are kind of taking it cautiously. Uh, currently, we are looking into the data of a few other cities, uh, Boston, for example, one, uh, which was not in the public domain, was not included in that eight city list. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we are kind of, uh, as I said, taking it cautiously. We don't want it to come up to be just a police priority policing tool. Uh, so let's see how it, where it goes. We really want it to be a policy prescription uh, mechanism or framework rather than just uh, someone incorporated into the uh, command centers and just sending police officers out where the algorithm says go there. That is not what we want it to be applied or, or, or deployed as. Thank yeah, I, I can understand it. because that's so needed right now. I can yeah. understand that you don't want that to limit the demand for that to limit the potential of this. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's like that, that broken window policy. We don't want to, I don't want to spend the rest of my career kind of saying that, oh, that was not what we meant in the paper. So so that's why we're a bit cautious about this. Right. I believe that Commissioner Freeman had a follow-up question, and then we'll move yeah. to Mayor Ellsbury. Oh, I put in the chat, um, is the tool open to communities to use? 
Yes, uh, it's not, well, it's, it's open in the sense that the, the, the code is on GitHub. It's an open, uh, anyone can download it and look at it. Uh, to use would mean that you need to have some, uh, you need to kind of adapt it to your use. It requires some programming skill. Uh, but the information is, uh, we have, it, it's in the public, it's, it's in the public. It's still well, not in the public domain. And one of the reasons, I mean, you still need a license to work with it if you're trying to do something commercial with it. Uh, and the, and we, have, we are still working out what should be the approach there. Uh, I decided not to put it blatantly in the, in the public domain because once I do that, then it basically, uh, anyone can take it and do whatever with it and right. no say in it. Right. Uh, Ashanu, let me, let me kind of tweak that question slightly. Uh, and I, I should point out to the commissioners that you've graciously agreed to uh, work collaboratively with us uh, to drive change here in Cook County. And I'm very grateful for that. But so to, to what extent in working with us would the, Commission have access and the necessary technical support to be able to use the tool in terms of its own policy making. Uh, it depends on the questions you're asking, but but yeah, that that should not be an issue. Uh, okay, well, that, the, yeah. the questions we're asking are largely going to be driven by where you think we ought to be taking this, right? Uh, because we're working initially off of your uh, actionable policy recommendations as those recommendations are tweaked, developed, incubated, based upon the very people you're talking with today. So to the extent that we can actually be hands-on either directly or through you or through your staff, I think that would more likely lead to a policy result in the form of an ordinance, for example, or a change in policing at the county level or other um, other uh, outcomes that are actually going to be beneficial to society, which is what we're all about. Yeah, that's that should not be a, an issue at all. Appreciate um, that. So, uh, 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 Mayor Ellsbury, thank you for your patience. You're up. Uh, no problem. I think a lot of people ask my question, but which is really interesting. Uh, you talk about the broken window syndrome. You know, I, I, I see you're steady on AI, but it seems so simple. I, I mean, I drive through communities where you know, you see the over -gra overgrown grass, uh, you see buildings board up, uh, you know, uh, autumn, autumn get a certain amount of money to do certain things, and there's certain things they just don't do. Mm -hmm. And the crime in those communities is just unbelievable. I drive through Roseland, and you see grass in, in public sector areas that's knee high. And yeah, you, you notice a high crime area just by driving through it. I, I know the AI, the, 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 uh, research you have done is showing that this does cause crime. I, I guess because I grew up in those kind of neighborhoods, I don't think it takes all of that to know if you got, if you have boarded up buildings, you got grass knee high, you have aldermen who don't take care of that. You don't need the police. And I have a lot of policemen in my family, my family they already know it's, it's crime there. I, I don't, I, I mean, this is great information, but I, I guess when you live it, it, it don't, it doesn't seem new to me. It just seems very basic. And if, if you take dollars, I was driving on the west side of the other day, if you take dollars and just cut down the public right of ways where you see grass going everywhere, but during the campaign season, we just came out of campaign season, I seen campaign literature on buildings that have been closed forever. People's pictures stumped up there, signs and overgrown area signs in, a, in an area say both for me. And this just, it blows me away that we continue to, we do a lot of research on this and it's so obvious. So. We, I think we studied this and studied this and uh, it, it just, I don't know. I, I mean, it's great information, but it's in our lives every day and it hasn't changed. So I, I don't know if that's a question or just a statement, but it's, it's just amazing that we continue to study this and the same thing continues, continues to continues and it doesn't change. So you. I don't know if the question is just a statement, but it's just I, I, I would let, let me make a comment on that. Uh, so, so yeah, so, pre so predicting where crime is or the crime rates, they are actually very predictable. You're absolutely right on that. Uh, it's not new, not just in Chicago, not just in uh, in US. It's pretty much not just around this time. If you go back hundreds of years, look at medieval Europe or other parts of the country, uh, where crime is, the crime rates are very, very stable and very, very predictable. Uh, locally, it's, it's that is that has been that way forever. Uh, 
what uh, this kind of approach, a data science approach, or what we are talking about in this study, um, allows you to do is if you want to, you can make things better. That's definitely what we should all uh, strive towards. But if you wanted to know when a particular event is happen is going to happen, that question is different from whether, on average, how many uh, breakings happen in a particular neighborhood. That and as asking when is the next break-in going to happen? Can we actually kind of intervene with that uh, in time? Again, that's not the only objective of the study, but that's that's a different question. I'm, just, I'm pointing out there's a different question than saying that this is a high crime area, this neighborhood looks a bit rundown, so maybe crime is higher. Uh, yeah, uh, looking at that, figuring that out is easier. Um, not that doesn't immediately tell you what would happen in the next week. Thank you very much. Uh, do any of the other commissioners have uh, questions? If not, I have a couple of my own. Uh, I don't see any. I think answer. Wendy raised her hand again and then uh, Bill. Is. No, uh, Bill Schleiser has his hand up. Oh, Bill, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. He, Schleiser. He, the uh, other, sure. and the other uh, Wendy had her hand up. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> I see. I see now. And I see Commissioner Freeman again. Okay. I apologize. I missed all those hands. Commissioner Schleiser, let's start with you. Um, yeah, so um, I kind of want to piggyback off the, the previous comments and, and, and conversation, um, because I think what we're interested in here is what policy can we utilize something like this for, for those interventions at a county scale that can actually be utilized both at, at point of time, but also forward investment so that we are changing the, the system so that this data helps drive and prioritize investments and programs that are actually effective. And my question is, how do we, how do we like, is there scenario planning that we can do for not only non-policing investments in community engagement, but also alternative into streetscaping and sustainability and green practices, not only the one, the, the kind of investments to make these things happen, but also into the maintenance of these investments and how that changes uh, neighborhood structure and composition and, and culture, because that's we're we're talking about quality of life indicators here, and the, what's important is not only in the investment but the maintenance around it. And um, if we overinvest and then under maintain, we're not solving systemic issues throughout the county. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, you kind of uh, have the answer to your to the question already. The part of the question. So yeah, we have to do all that definitely quality of life indicators, uh, investment and maintenance. Uh, what these tools bring more to the table is to kind of see where those investments would happen. And given again, the constraints on what, how much resources are available, how much maintenance can be done, we can uh, model that, we can kind of uh, see what is the optimal kind of uh, allocation there, right? Thank you. Commissioner Freeman? Um would the tool be able to predict decrease in the types of um, crime that it's currently measuring? Yes. Yes. I mean, that, that's one of the things we did. When we looked at uh, um, uh, what this kind of this uh, biased response from law enforcement when uh, you perturb the crime rates. So we did it both ways, crime rates increasing, decreasing, and we saw that the, the ones who control for the di differential crime rates in different neighborhoods, there's still a dependence on the socioeconomic factors which should be there. So yeah, you can, uh, it, it does go up and down. You can, uh, the model kind of predicts increase and decreases. Thank you. Commissioner Dubow. Thank you. Yeah, I think just to add to several comments that have been made before, um, you know, whether it's on the policing side, whether it's on the, you know, in terms of deployment or it's on community investment, investment around the county in um, neighborhoods in, in Cook County, you know, this adds a lot of transparency that, you know, previously didn't exist and you know, not necessarily with bad intent. I mean, the, maybe the tools haven't been so easy to reach is this. And so I think there's this great opportunity to pick a couple of areas and with this data, you know, put it out there transparently and then, you know, take a sober look at, well, where is investment going? And, you know, I think Bill mentioned a couple of areas. I also happen to think a lot of the resources for crime is put into, and public safety is put into police. So that is one area. 
right, which should not be overlooked. And I think that this is a, it's an interesting area to look at with police because it's, you know, especially if you look at it based on the geography data that you gave, right? It, it takes some of the targeting of people out, but where are we? Where are we not investing the right amount according to the data? And where, where are we over investing? I thought you know you made an interesting point about that too. Are we over investing in you know certain areas where crime is rising, but but it's still not the right amount of increased investment to go to that place versus other neighborhoods. And so you know I think that that's really interesting for the county to be able to look at some of that and pick a couple of areas and try to say what what does that say about policy and how do we change policy to more accurately reflect those those predictions you know those those grounded predictions yeah i hear i hear, I hear silence which i interpret as concurrence uh i think commissioner rice you might have had an observation am i right uh yes i i wanted to take this uh you know again thank you thank you for your presentation uh, to how do we move forward from a community uh, basis standpoint on developing pro programs around this and whether or not there's supportive help in designing these programs to make an impact as well as the evaluation and a template on determining success. Um. So we, we can go towards that. I don't have that ready, uh, but it's broadly on the lines of the, uh, the ideas that I talked about, that we can do a lot of things. Mostly things are constrained by resources. And what this kind of data-driven tools allow you to do is to see what would be the impact of these policies and where we should uh, expand the resources, how we should do that, giving a kind of being able to quantify the long-term effects uh, towards the goals that we have, right? Okay. Thank you. So I have a question or two, if I may. I appreciate your your patience with us as we learn. Um, my understanding is that you've uh, uh, arrived at about a ninety percent success rate in terms of predicting crime, and uh, it's more than saying that places that are ridden with crime tend to have more crime. It really fits within a temporal box, right? So it's a, a, a fairly um, immediate predictor of what's going on and how you might address it, um, as I understand your thesis. Um, but one of the things you said to me, well, several things you said to me, but one in particular that struck me is also kind of a temporal consideration. And I wanted to ask you about that. You mentioned in passing a 30-year cycle. Mm -hmm. And I could understand if this were a 20 year cycle that it might be something generational, but perhaps you can educate us about what is that 30 year cycle and how does it bear on your research or analysis and your forecasts? Uh, it, it, ha it doesn't have any bearing on, on our well, what, what is the 30 year cycle? Let's start uh, let there. Me, uh, now that you mention it, that uh, it's, that's kind of an interesting point that if it is, th if it's 30 years, if it's 40 years, I think it's not exactly 30 years. Just well, maybe you could tell us what it is, and then we could seek to quantify it or not. Yeah, it's about, say, that the last peak was in about 1980, around 1980s. Before that, the peak was in about 1920. So really, it's like a 60-year cycle. So I was half... Uh, so okay, so this is, still an, this is still another variable that factors into the analysis. Is that right? No, it doesn't. I mean, it you does can't. Not. Uh, no, it doesn't. And not only that, we can, we cannot, we did not use, and we could not use data more than three years in the past, right? Okay. Because if you go back, and and Chicago has that. Chicago has data going back to about 2000, 2000 or 2001. So they have like 22 years of data. Um, but we don't want to use it because if you go back to 2001, things were different. The roads were different. The way the social connectivity, the actual transportation routes were different. People didn't have as many cell phones. Uh, so things were different. The whole uh, sociology, the, the topology of the city was different. So you can't have one model that predicts. I'm just curious as to this cycle you mentioned and no one knows. what we're supposed to infer from that. Uh, no one knows what to infer from that. I mean, it's one of those <laughs> things, right? The, the broken window policy, which when that was uh, uh, deployed and the argument was, see, crime is going down. 
because crime was going down. If you just measure, crime was going down. Right. But uh, what was happening is the crime was going down in every city, irrespective of whether there was that policy uh, deployed or not. And also crime was going down for some reason in the entire world. So uh, there are theories about it, but uh, it does kind of, uh, no one really knows what. That's kind of what yeah, social and, and theory actually, has my been. Other, my, other, my other question related to the broken window theory, and that is, you know, I, I, I understood that it had been debunked. Maybe you can educate me about that. But in any event, I, I see that even in your presentation, you were looking at uh, property crimes and the way in which there is a um, criminal justice reaction to property, property crimes may be an indicator of what uh, violent crimes may lie ahead. And, and that struck me as surprising, given my understanding that the broken windows theory is not to be relied upon, or maybe you're talking about something very different. So maybe so, you can help us with that too. So the broken window policy, as it was deployed in New York City, that's the most obvious example. Yes. Yeah, that, that, is, that is obviously not correct. And that has yes. been kind of uh, uh, debunked. And again, when you say debunked, uh, you have to kind of think about what does that mean? Well, first of all, what, does it, what did it mean that it worked? What was the claims? It was somebody's opinion. So when someone is kind of makes, makes a statement without any proof, it can be dismissed. Well, I, I think uh, what I understood it so. to do was uh, create a, a, a causal link rather than really a correlation. Yeah, but that was never established, right? So, okay, so that fair is, enough. But how does, yeah. it, how does that track with what you've included now in your presentation? In our case, so we, we, yes. what we do is we look at uh, violent crimes, we look at property crimes separately, but the models can interact. So in the sense that, you, you predict, you suppose you have a bunch of models predicting violent crime at a particular location. You also have a bunch of models predicting uh, property crimes at a particular location. Now together, they can predict either violent or property crime somewhere else. So basically what I'm trying to say is we kind of model them separately, but the network that is used for predicting future events uh, incorporates all of them. So it is, it is not as simple. Is there an interaction between property crimes and violent crimes? There is. Because if you just uh, forget about the property crimes, just model the violent crimes and try to predict violent crimes with those models, you yeah. do you do you do worse. So there is um, in, there is an interaction, but the interaction is not like what the broken window. It's not as simplistic as that. Yeah, so it okay. is much much more complex, and you can't really write down a simple prescription as whenever you see someone breaking a window, send them to jail, and that will bring down violent crime. It, it's not that. No, it's I understand. More okay. complicated. There are interactions, but the interactions are very complex. Well, very, very helpful. I appreciate that. So let me let me just mention for the benefit of the commissioners that uh, not only have you very generously agreed to continue to work with us as we sort through these issues and see what kinds of policies we might develop out of them. Um, uh, Commissioner Alston, who is chairing the working group around the um, uh, crime and criminal justice issues that were raised last month by Jens Ludwig, uh, he is taking this on as well. So we're going to be able to work with, with you and Jens under uh, Commissioner uh, Austin's uh, leadership in the working group. Uh, Commissioner DeBow has also graciously consented to work within this same group, and she has a very significant experience in this area as well. Um, and uh, I would like to invite any other commissioners who may be interested in participating in the working group. Uh, please let me and commission and or Commissioner Alston know, uh, and because we'd love to have you, and I'm going to be participating in the group as well. And beyond that, if there are others not members of the commission that you think we should uh, invite to join this effort, uh, okay, Commissioner Freeman, you're in it. We're grateful. Thank you. Um, if, if there are others who are not commissioners that you think uh, have experience, uh, expertise, knowledge in this area, I understood. Uh, Commissioner Freeman has a, a hot project going on. We wish her well with it, and but she wants to join us uh, after uh, the, the first of the month. Uh, but if any of you have any uh, one interest in your own part in joining, we'd love to have you. Beyond that, if you know of others that you could reach out to or you would like uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Anaya or me to work out 
reach out to. You know, obviously, we want to get as much intellectual firepower behind this effort as we possibly can. Uh, so I. Uh, Commissioner Freeman is asking if you might do a presentation to a town hall in Garfield Park. So I'm getting a business here. I don't know if you wanted business, but we're, we're you're, you're getting a lot, think, a lot uh, of interest think, uh, within the group and even extending now beyond the group. Right, right. I, I think uh, Commissioner Anaya has a question, or is it just you forgot to put your hand down? Uh, no, it was, uh, Commissioner Freeman, I believe, asked if you would be willing to speak to a uh, to a, a neighborhood group. Yeah, no, I, I would be I'd be happy to. But I'm seeing I'm saying that Commissioner Anaya has a hand up. I, I did. I I, I think oh, um I, sorry, I did, to see sorry, you. sorry about that, Vice Chair. I, I just wanted to chime in really quickly before we go on to, to next steps. Uh just because I actually had a public hearing in the county last week um regarding data and, and data brokers. So this is uh, extremely timely on my end uh, to be hearing from you know your study and some of the outputs that, that came out. And I think uh Given the fact that uh, you know data um, in this day and age uh, and policing are two of the most complex um, issues uh, that society that society has to deal with, I think it's it's extremely interesting um, to find out you know how it's being you know utilized, how it could better um, a, a lot of the the resources. Um, but also just wanted to you know put out, put out something that that was an observation of mine. So in the public hearing um, that we had regarding uh, data brokers, um, one of the biggest concerns that came out was you know privacy um, and how exactly information comes out and is distributed. Um, in the biggest uh, part of the discussion um, was in regards to how law enforcement agencies utilize the data to target individuals, uh, particularly uh, if we were talking about um, ICE and how that information is, is really utilized to target communities, cause raids, um, and then also uh, help aid, you know, separation of families. So I'm quite glad that you mentioned that um, that there are certain things that were taken into consideration. So no prediction on individuals, no I, I identification identification data, no privacy encroachment, no hidden list, et cetera. So I think that that's a really great first step. And I just want, you know, thought that that it's important to highlight that because there is a lot of instances where policing in communities of color and in immigrant communities um, or in any type of data that's being utilized, it's always a really big red flag um, because there's so much distrust, right? Um, and knowing that this is helping us guide conversation regarding policies, um, I think um, it's important, important to also note, you know, that although there may be no intent to target communities, um, that is always something that we might have to deal with, right? The data might still show that because of lack of resources, there's still, there's still certain pockets where, you know, crime may be higher without, you know, obviously taking into consideration um, the race or community. That's just the reality of it. So uh, I guess my question um, is you chose not to uh, utilize the certain information, right, or make that as a, as a, as a goal. Um, but there are other entities, I know that this was briefly discussed, other bigger data brokers that are making million, millions of dollars off selling uh, ident identifiable uh, data. Um, you know, what can we do, or if there are any, obviously, uh, discussion uh, within within your report of what can be also done so that it isn't a, a way of targeting communities um, and how can we utilize that um, to to somehow be able to um, regulate um, the the different types of data that comes forward and that it's utilized in a very positive way as opposed to another tool that is being used against communities and it's it was kind of briefly addressed that, you know, there is uh, that that sense. Um, so I think that that's something that needs to be taken into consideration and definitely something that the county board is looking at um, very closely. Um, so I just kind of wanted to see if you uh, had any so, yeah. policy recommendations around that. So it's a very hard problem, right? So the tools are here. The, the computing technology is here. The data is now more and more easily accessible. 
so the kind of problems that you are citing is is here already and is going to be here. Uh, it's not going to go away. You won't be able. There's no. I don't think it's possible to legislate it away because it's there. The technology is there. It will be used. Um, so what what can we do? I think what we can do is obviously there are obviously laws in place which uh, which make it illegal to discriminate against communities and stuff. We have to make those laws um, maybe more potent one, and then we need means to uh, enforce those. And that's why this kind of tools that we are talking about today comes in, right? So if Google or any other agency is doing something um, and it is illegal and is doing something illegal in terms of uh, um, in terms of discriminating against communities or something to that effect, then can we actually analyze the data, analyze those actions and prove that, they, that there is discrimination going on? There is uh, disparities uh, existing in those policies or those actions. So this kind of tool actually uh, allows you to audit the, the state in that sense. So so that's that's what we can do. If you ask me, it's not going to be um, I don't think it, ha- it, 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 is, it is likely that we will be able to roll back the clock and nor do we want to. I mean, artificial intelligence, all those data analytics are uh, incredibly useful tools which can make everyone's life better, not just for us, for everyone on the planet. So it's not something that we don't, that we, that we, that we do not want to, uh, or that we want to not have. We, don't, we do want this, these tools. They are very, very, uh, they can kind of change our lives. But we also have to be careful that this doesn't lead to, um, well, a dystopian future, right? And the way to stop it is to be able to kind of audit the actions uh, in kind of more democratized uh, AI tools like the ones we're talking about today. Absolutely. And thank you for that. And I think one of the biggest concerns that um, we discussed was accessibility. Um, so you did state that, you know, it will be, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's available for individuals to utilize it. Um, and I think that that's something also that um, that we're looking at in Cook County, how our public facing data, um, you know, how it's being utilized and how exactly um, if there is any type of um, data that could be targeting communities, uh, particularly in, in a negative way, like how do we um, in turn really do some quote unquote so searching to see if that data needs to be made public. Um, so, so again, I, I just, it's a quick observation about, you know, Cook County is already looking at, at this stuff in, in a different lens, right, in a different way, not necessarily uh, within your study and, and, and what, um, what came out of, uh, you know, your study and the recommendations, but just in general, because we are in a very pivotal moment for data. To your point, it's not something we can kind of, you know, wave a wand and make go away. So, so there's definitely a lot of um, internal discussion about data. Um, an internal discussion about all the accessibility of the data and how it's being utilized. So I just, you know, wanted to make sure to put that out there. So thank you so much for your presentation. We appreciate you. Thank you, Commissioner Naya. And uh, Shana, we're going to move on to other business. You're, we're grateful for your participation today and all you will be doing with us going forward. Uh, and uh, you, we invite you to stick around and, uh, per, and listen to the rest of our presentations today. But uh, we're, very, we're very grateful to you. And if you need to take off, we certainly understand that as well. So thanks again. And we'll be in touch with you as we move on. Okay, great. Now I will take off uh, to head home. Uh, but thank you, everyone. It was great talking to you. And uh, very, uh, just, uh, I, I really like talking about, I and mean, that's, not, that's not surprising that I like talking about my work. But uh, I, I really enjoyed the questions. And well, we like, we like talking about your work too. And I think <laughs> we'll like it even more. But thank okay. you. Uh, and yeah, I'd, I'd be very happy to talk to uh, other groups, um, Garfield Park, or I, I, yeah, as I said, I am uh, obsessed with my work. So very, I very kind of you. So, Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. So um, we'll move on to our next item on our agenda, which were the reports for the committees. Um, so I'll hand it back uh, to Vice Chair Lane. Thank you. Uh, so um, I, I believe, um, well, let me, I, I believe there are going to be reports from three different working groups uh, because we have uh, some folks uh, who are not in attendance today, but if there's any other working group that I'm not calling upon, then 
there's a representative of that group that would like to make a presentation, we'd be thrilled to hear it. So I'm going to start with the community investment vehicle working group, and that would be commissioners Freeman and Raymer. If either of you or both of you have uh, anything to report, we'd uh, we'd appreciate that. Kristen, since you're here, did you want to give it? Or I can do it and you can chime in after. Yeah, you got it, Wendy. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so just to refresh everybody, um, this particular committee, um, we are examining the feasibility and trying to identify good uh, options to do a community investment uh, vehicle pilot or initiative here in Cook County. Um, as we discovered in our uh, presentations to the full commission and then through our own committee research and discussions, there's a lot out there that we could um, consider and certainly a lot of need and opportunity um, to, to try and get something off the ground. So our, our goal is to uh, come out of this uh, with some drafted uh, legislative language, get a um, resolution out there for um, us to present to the Cook County. Um, the, the next steps in this, um, in our committee work, we have um, put together a uh, project referral form um, we've discussed um, what are the elements that we want to hear about, what elements um, would be good to know as we consider a particular project for a pilot. And we have drafted that referral form that we would like to uh, send out to the full commission. We know that you guys are all involved in a lot of, you know, initiatives and community projects, and we'd love to poll you guys and get your input into what you are seeing out there that could be a good project for us to take a look at for a pilot. So um, we'll be following up with that form to get it distributed. And from the submissions that are, are given, we will assess on the committee level and um, come up with a proposal and meet with Commissioner Anaya on kind of her thoughts of where we're at and her guidance um, as to what we really could, you know, propose in an ordinance. And we would like to do this, um, you know, within a certain time frame. We, we had this kind of back in July, kind of doing this in July but with the delay, I think what we want to do now is move it into the August timeframe. So if Kristen, if you're good with this, I will say that we will get this referral form out to the commission with the goal of getting your feedback on the form. If you have any things that you think are missing or, or could be, you know, further clarified, but for sure your, um, insight into what projects are out there for us to take a look at for a potential pilot. Having those sent to myself and Kristen by the end of the month. And then from there, we will assess them, review them, and then come to Commissioner Anaya with um, our uh, thoughts about where we could start a pilot and what that would take as far as county uh, support, whether through funding or logistical support or what, whatever it might be. That is my update. Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> uh, and uh, let's move on to Commissioner Yonan. Do you have a report on the underutilized church property? Yeah. You? Uh, nothing from the last report, which I know a few notes were captured in the meeting minutes, but uh, nothing new as of this month, Chairman. Okay, thank you. And mm -hmm. Commissioner Killen, do you have a report on the electric vehicle working group? Yes, thank you, Mark. So no report on the working group just yet. I'm actually working with um, some other departments in the county where there may be some overlap on this work and getting a better handle on what is being done and what is not being done and what meaningful role our working group can play um, as it relates to this topic. So there's some research and investigation underway um, with the working group to form. Very much appreciate that. 
And uh, Commissioner Austin asked me to convey his regret at not being able to participate. He's been out of town in today's meeting. However, he has asked if Thalia might send him a recording of today's meeting uh, and uh, probably be a good idea to send one to uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Ludwig as well, since he'll be participating in the working group uh, along with today's witness and get everybody kind of up to speed as to where we're at is between last month's and this month's presentations where, which are being consolidated for incubation within Commissioner Alston's working group. Um, otherwise, I don't think we have a report on the Diverse Talent Pipeline Working Group, the Reparations uh, Working Group. Uh, am I correct about that? Or is anyone speaking on behalf of either of those groups? If not, I think we have uh, exhausted that topic, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, so what, what I'll do is, Dalia, um, I know that I mentioned this earlier, but I just want to make sure that um, that we have it recorded for the attendance. Commissioner Cooley uh, is in attendance and also we have ex officio, Dr. Criticals is also on the call. So the minutes can also make sure that we, we have those two individuals. Um, so other than that, I will open it up for any final, um, if there's any announcements or any other um, uh, needs questions. Um, yeah, Madam Chair, in as ahead. much as we now have a quorum, would we like to approve the minutes of the last we, meeting? We do not have a quorum. Christy De Laurentiis ah, to jump off. That, so unfortunately, yes, yeah, we'll have to table the minutes, everyone. So we'll just approve both um, the July and August meetings at our next meeting minutes at our next meeting. So um, I see no hands raised, so um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I would just like to make one observation, if I may, and it'll be very brief. I would just like to thank everybody for a very uh, productive and interesting uh, conversation today. And I have every reason to believe it will lead to actionable policy recommendations in this urgent area. So I'd just like to extend my gratitude to everybody for being an active participant in this meeting as you have in prior meetings and as no doubt you will in future meetings. So thanks to each of you. Thank you, Vice Chair Lane. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, so uh, Superintendent Killen and second by... Allsbury. Um, okay, Mayor Allsbury. Okay, um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Hi. 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 Suppose the ice habit. Have a wonderful rest of your summer. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Night. Bye bye.